Today's message to me is the most passionate message of this series that I've had the opportunity to study for. It is so exciting to learn about Jesus' second coming. And let me just say this at the beginning. When we're talking about Jesus, sometimes people think this is a book of mythology and that Jesus is not going to come back. I want you to think about Jesus' first coming in the flesh. Your calendar is separated by the day he was born. Jesus is the most popular name in all the world. His Bible is the most read book. He has influenced more cultures, more leaders, and more countries than any leader before. And today his message grows eight times faster than the rate of birth. Listen to me somebody. As surely as he came the first time, he's coming back the second time. Your calendar marks the date of his birth. Trust me my friends, this is not a myth. He came, he lived, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, rose again on the third day, ascended to heaven, and told his disciples, I'll be back. Are you all ready for this ser uh, sermon today? Can you say, I'm ready? Amen. So I wanted to encourage you with that. I wish I had more time to talk about the, the legitimacy of the Bible. But I know most of you believe it. Those who don't will... Uh, uh, give you other lessons to look at in another time. Today, we are going to talk about the second coming of Jesus, and by doing so, we're going to give you a chart that I spent some time making so as to help you see where everything fits together. Number one, we see the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus around 33 A.D. Number two, we see Pentecost, the beginning of the last days at that same time. Pente meaning 50, 50 days after Passover comes Pentecost. My friends, when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, found in your Bible, Acts chapter 2, he quoted an Old Testament prophet by the name of Joel, and he said, Joel's words are now being fulfilled. The last days have come upon us. Everybody say, the last days. Thank you. So the last day started on the day of Pentecost. Number three, the destruction of the Jewish temple, 70 A.D. Number four is put here because what happened was the rise of the Roman Catholic Church. And if it wasn't for a protesting against the Roman Catholic Church, taking the Bible off the lectern in Latin and translating into the language of the people with William Tyndale, John Huss, and the other reformers, we never would have had the opportunity for the growth of the Christian church we're seeing here. So number four is the beginning of the Reformation in 1517 with Martin Luther nailing 95 theses to the doors of Wittenberg. Number five, we see gaining of Israel and Jerusalem now begins to mark the last generation. Everybody say last days, and now say last generation. Thank you. The Bible talks about last days. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord. A thousand years is like a day. So Jesus has been gone for 2,000 years. How many days are in a weekend? Two days, right? Jesus just said, hey, guys, it's Friday. I'll be back on Monday. I'm going to see my father for the weekend. Okay? In heaven's mentality, a 1,000 years is like a day. He's only been gone for the weekend. We're all like freaking out. Where's Jesus, man? Jesus is just at his father's house for the weekend. He's coming back. Look at your neighbor and say, he's coming back. Thank you. And how do we know? Because he said, when you see Israel as the fig tree blossom, Matthew 24, you know that this last generation has come upon you or these signs will begin to come and the last generation will see all of these things. And in 1948, Israel became a nation. They had not had their, their own occupancy of their country for over 1,800 years. So this was the miracle of that time and is now starting the last generation. 1967, they got the occupancy of Jerusalem. There were two different battles they had to fight. Now during this time between 5 and 6, we see the signs and the events of the end times. Everybody go, ooh. See, that's what we're talking about. You're going to see all those being fulfilled in this generation. Now, what we're waiting for, question mark, don't know when it's going to happen. Number six is the rapture of the church. Now, this is something that we believe will happen before the tribulation, and I'll tell you why in just a little bit. But the rapture of the church means the church goes to meet Jesus in the air. Then number seven and eight will happen quickly. The rise of the Antichrist, number seven and eight, the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. Now during this time starts the three and a half years of peace. The Christians are gone. The Antichrist has arisen. He makes one world government, one world religion, and he begins to bring peace in the Middle East, and they build their temple. 
Okay? But then during, uh, in, in number eight, they build their temple. But what happens is he defiles the temple, persecutes the Jews, and so now we get to number nine, the bowls of God's wrath. Everybody go, ooh. The bowls of God's wrath. That's some pretty serious stuff. And that becomes now the three and a half years of tribulation. Forty-two months is three and a half years. You see that recognized throughout uh, Daniel and in Revelation. Then after the bowls of wrath, number 10, Jesus comes, battle of Armageddon. After this, some people think we go back to heaven and live forevermore in heaven. No, the Bible says there's then a thousand-year reign with Christ on the earth, and we as believers rule and reign with him as kings and priests. And this is where your reward kind of dictates who you'll be in heaven, uh, I mean upon the new earth. So some of you may be the janitor on the new earth because all y'all do is just come to church on Sunday. Okay, but those of you who go to life group and are really crazy and radical, you're going to be king. Bum, 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 bum. You're going to be ruling and reigning, amen, but you're going to be a nice king, amen. You're going to be a nice king. Let's everybody say a nice king. I'm not making it up. It's in the Bible, okay? You're going to get rewarded and judged as a Christian and then have a place in the millennial kingdom. Then after millennial reign of Christ, number 11, will be the white throne judgment. And God will judge everyone. And then ultimately, new heaven and earth, boom, here. We're going to spend eternity here on earth. Heaven is just the waiting place. It's just the resort. This is where we spend eternity. Hell is just the county jail until the white throne judgment, which is the day of court. The penitentiary is the lake of fire. How many know the difference between the county and the penitentiary? Somebody say amen. Okay, watch out for those people who just said amen. You know they know what's up. They got a little bit of a pass, but I got my hand up in the air. Okay, I'm locked up. You know, look at the last point. Eternity, eternity is where we're going to be with Jesus. Are you all ready for this? Somebody say I'm ready. Okay, let's get into this. Let's start with number five. We look at signs and events of the end time. So right now, we are this last generation. Now let me explain to you what I mean by generation. There's about three different ways to look at a generation. Uh, one way to look at a generation when it's talked about in the Bible is 40 years. 40 years would mark a generation, kind of similar to how we look at it here. Uh, we look at it a little bit less, around 20 years in our culture, between you know the hippies and the 60s and the baby booners and Generation X, etc. So one possibility is 40 years in the Bible. Another way to look at a generation in the Bible would be 70 years, the life of a person, which the Bible says three score and ten. Score is 20 in about 70 years. And another definition of generation could be a time period of people who, say, who share the same ideals. So meaning uh, postmodernism can capture a generation of multi-ages and decades, just like modernism, etc. Now, I somewhere choose to believe a generation is between a lifetime and a time period, but not going on into hundreds and hundreds of years, and I'll share with you why. When Israel was a nation, something changed on the end times uh, timetable. You see, all the way up until this time, sure, Paul thought Jesus was coming back in his day. Sure, the Wesleyans of the 18th century thought Jesus was coming back. Christians have always lived like this, and this is good to believe Jesus is coming back. But there was a problem. Everybody's generation, their life, their span, they never had Israel being occupied by the Jewish people. Are you guys tracking with me? Think about this. That means when John Wesley was saying, okay, Jesus can come back in my lifetime in the 1700s, the Jewish people didn't have Israel. That had to be done. They had to rebuild a temple. That hadn't been done. But guess what? This generation, this time period, the people who were alive during 1967 who are still alive now and can still live for a good number, 10, 20, 15 years, 30 years, my friends, they saw Israel get occupied. And if not them personally, maybe their children. So if you want me to put a timeline on this, an exact number, I won't. God actually forbids us to do that. He actually says later on we're going to read. He says, I'm coming as a thief in the night when you don't expect me. Okay, because let's keep it real. If we all knew when Jesus was coming back, how many know some crazy people would be at the club last night, you know? And they're just like, why? Because Jesus is coming back next week. I'm all good. You know, people would try to get away with some crazy stuff if they knew Jesus was coming back on this day at this time. Harold Camping, May 21st, all that's crazy. Look at your neighbor and go, loco. Okay, 2012, crazy. My guesstimate out of looking at the Bible, sometime within my life or my children's. There we go. Why? Because Israel has become a nation, and now we're seeing all of these things fulfilled. Let's take a look at some of the things Jesus told us to look out for. Number one, the destruction of the temple. He said that in his lifetime, 33 A.D., happened 40 years later. Why is that so important? Because 
the temple is rebuilt in the book of Revelation. The temple is there in the book of Zechariah. It's there in the book of Daniel. So first it had to be destroyed, and then he said, now let's count down the clock. Is everybody tracking with me? It's like when it got destroyed, he flipped over the hourglass, and he said, now when you see Israel become a nation again, you know this generation is the last one. Okay? So the destruction of seven, the temple of 70 AD is important. Now, from the point uh, of this last generation, what they're going to see is false Christ. We now see over a thousand in the last 50 years, more than ever before. What wars and revolutions, more than ever before, over 40 since 1940. Famines, over a billion people around the world starving. Earthquakes, increase in major earthquakes last last 40 years. Major earthquakes, uh, quakes, diseases, 30 million. All of you guys saw the charts. I got them from the websites, from the the agencies that track global health, uh, global earthquakes, not even Christian sites. I showed them to you. Now watch. Some people may say, well, Jesus could have guessed this. You know, there's going to be bad times before I come. Like, okay, well, what's a bad time? Jesus gets very specific here. So let's look at this right now. Since 1948, specifically since 1967, this occupancy of Israel, have there been more earthquakes, the same amount of earthquakes, or less, less earthquakes? What did we see by those charts that I showed you from the website of uh, the USA governmental website that tracks earthquakes? Is it going up, staying the same, or going down? It's going up. How about starvation? Since 1948, has global hunger been going down, staying the same, or has it been going up? Uh, the wars and rumors of wars, has the world leveled out, gotten more peaceful since 1948? Is it staying the same or is it getting more uh, adversity, more wars? How about disease? Since 1948, have we been curing more diseases? Have we been holding back uh, epidemics? Has it been staying the same or has it been getting worse? It's been getting worse. So what do we see? The signs, the events of the end times are happening. Can you say amen? How about this? Persecution of Christians right now. Over 100,000 Christians die each year. More Christians die now than in any time on the planet right now. 100 just in Egypt a few months ago. You can ask our Egyptian brother. God is showing us by these signs. It's not staying the same since 1948, and it's not going down. It's doing exactly what it said would happen. When you see the olive tree Israel bud, when you see them get their land again, all of these things will start to happen and start to increase as birth pains until he comes. Then sin will abound. Violence, homosexuality, and abortion alone can show us the increase. Think about how many people have been killed in America's abortion clinics, 40 million, almost double that in China's abortion clinics and infanticide. We have made all the other nations infanticide of the Babylonians and the Romans look like Sunday school workers compared to what has happened since 1948 in this generation. Are you all tracking with me? Then the Bible says the gospel will be preached. This is the last thing before the rapture, the gospel being preached. God said all will hear. There will be no excuse. Everybody around the world will hear. Has Christianity stayed the same, plateaued since 1948, gone down, or is it going up? It is growing right now eight times faster than the rate of birth. That means the time somebody is born in a hospital, eight more are born again shouting hallelujah on their way to heaven. Can you give me a taste of that right now? Somebody shout hallelujah. Woo, come on, hallelujah. God is good. Now look at these things that we can see prophesied in the Bible. Israel becoming a nation, Isaiah 68, 8, happened in 1948. Jerusalem in Jewish hands, prophesied in Psalms 102, happened in 1968. Explosion of knowledge, Daniel 12, 4. God told Daniel 500 years before Jesus. This is 2,500 years before our day. God told Daniel things. He said, these things are not for you. These are for the last days. You'll know they're the last days when knowledge explodes. Do you remember when I played the video? What does it mean by a secular futurist group that is telling us that we are now doubling our capacity of knowledge two times every year? People starting college in a first-year study, by the time they graduate a technical degree with a four-year degree, the things they've already learned the first and second year are now outdated. Do you remember that? Not even a Christian website. They say by the year 2012, 14, somewhere in the next five to ten years, they're going to be able to make a computer that can outcompute the human brain. 
This is all among us right now, more than any other generation before. Nuclear warfare. Zechariah 14.12 says, In the last times that people's flesh, their eye sockets, their tongue, will dissolve while their body is still standing when God sends his plague. We talked about nuclear warfare in the blast radius that can come with the great gust of wind and ten seat. Your body and your organs can rot inside the body while the bones are still standing. We then learned about live satellite TV, Revelation 11, 9 through 10. It says that when the Antichrist puts to death the two prophets, the whole world, every nation, sees it happening. And my friends, while we're doing this series, Omar Gaddafi is caught and slaughtered on TV and the whole world sees. That's exactly what they're going to do to us, the Christians, and the world will see. Telstar did it first in 1962. Somebody say, preach it. Amen. So that's number five, going now to the rapture. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. And now let's look at the rapture. The next thing that we are waiting for as the gospel is being preached is a catching away of the church. And I'll share with you what that means. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up. Everybody say caught up. Thank you. Together with them in the air, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so be with him forever. Everybody say caught up. Thank you. Caught up is the Greek word rapture, to be caught up. Excuse me, it comes from the Latin word caught up. Why is this important to understand? When we get into these times of the tribulation, in the time of the Antichrist, it wouldn't make sense if there's as many Christians on the planet as there are right now. If you put us with the Catholics, there's almost three billion of us on the planet right now. There's over a billion Protestant believers and over a billion um, Catholic believers, okay? So there's no way a one-ruled government and religion could take over and try to snuff out Christianity while we're here. So what most Christians believe, the Assemblies of God, the Bible college that I went to, most evangelical Christians believe in what is called a pre-tribulation rapture. Everybody say pre-tribulation. Okay, now the rest of the congregation will say it with us. One, two, three, pre-tribulation. Thank you, class. Okay, so what we believe is before tribulation starts, the three and a half years of peace and the three and a half years of tribulation, we believe that the church has to be moved out of the way. And what this talks about is literally we will get beamed up and our bodies will be changed into heavenly bodies and then we'll be with the Lord while those seven years are going on. And most of us believe we'll be at the the wedding feast of the Lamb, getting some yummies for our tummies while all of that stuff is going down. Everybody say amen. Amen. Just be ready to go on the first trip out of here. Amen. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and see what Paul says about the rapture and then I'll go a little bit more in depth and to the options of the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. Everybody say, a mystery. Thank you, okay? It is a mystery. So why we can't say for sure, like for sure I know. We're doing our best. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Everybody say, changed. Thank you. Remember when Jesus rose from the dead? He had a body that could walk through walls. You remember he did that and he showed up with the disciples. He was like, hey guys, and they were all freaking out. Okay, and then he ascended to heaven. And by the way, we don't believe heaven is right outside of Pluto or in the Pegasus galaxy. We believe heaven is another dimension. Everybody tracking with me here, okay? You're not going to take a rocket ship to heaven and be like, que paso, Jesus, let's hang out. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. The Bible says at a moment in time, we're going to get caught up, raptured into to the air, our bodies that are now flesh and blood will turn into a body like Jesus. We're not going to be floating vapors of steam up in heaven like a coffee pot with a little steam. Go, who's that? Oh, that's Bobby, a little steam, okay? We're not going to be little floating orbs in heaven. Like, who's that orb right there? Oh, that's Bob. Okay, we're not floating orbs, we're not little steam. We're made in the image of God. Like Jesus' resurrection body can go to heaven, it looks like a body. We're not going to turn into like steam or an orb. This will happen at the rapture. Now the two options that Christians, good Christians, debate and discuss over is whether the rapture happens before the tribulation or after the tribulation. So if you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, what that means is Jesus calls up us up out of here before it gets bad upon this earth. And why we believe that, because this church does, Assembly of God and others, most of us do, is because we don't think the Antichrist and all of this could happen upon the earth, number one. Number two, the Bible says in Thessalonians, God didn't appoint us to suffer wrath, and there will be no way to be on this earth and not be getting hit with these bowls of wrath that are coming down. 
Now, people who believe in post-tribulation rapture, what they say is, like how God and the Israelites went through Egypt during the time of the plagues. Does anybody remember the plagues of Moses during that time? Charlton Heston, Ten Commandments. Anybody watch it? Prince of Egypt, anybody? Okay, Ten Commandments. How many know the Ten Commandments? Can I get somebody to raise their hand? Just wave it like you just don't care. Come on. Now you remember, Israelites were in Egypt while the boils were coming, while the hailstorms were coming, while the rivers were turning to blood. And so what a post-tribulation person will say is, like the Israelites going through the trials and tribulations, but God spared them, they didn't get the plagues, their water didn't turn to blood, God will protect us and we will go through it. Now that's a good thought there, but since we're pre-tribulation, I'm just going to tell you why I don't believe that. These bowls of wrath are coming down on everybody. The Bible doesn't say a region or an area, and there are over a billion Christians now. We're going to keep growing, probably three billion of us. There is no way these fire, uh, fires from heaven can come down and not touch us. And once again, I don't think God wants us to go through it. So we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Bam. That's what we're waiting for right there. Everybody just go, bam. Amen. Let's keep going on here. And this is what you may look like as you go up to heaven. Everybody just go like this. That's what you may look like going up to heaven. Just be ready, y'all, okay? And now uh, what's going to happen right after the rapture? And we talked about this last week, how I think this all works together. Because who's going to be the dupe that gets a tattoo on their head and starts worshiping the Antichrist? No, I'm not going to do that. You think, Joe, that... You know, Joe the plumber, you know, guy sitting at the bar is going to start getting a tattoo and worship a man. What is going to happen to cause the catastrophe is going to have to be so large of an event that whatever this man does out of his wisdom and intrigue and pulls it together, we're going to look to him like he's a God. And so what we think is after the rapture, say half of us go to heaven, three billion, right? This leader is going to come forth, the Antichrist, and he's going to tell a story like this, just an idea, speculating, like this. They've been taken by aliens. It's my job to communicate with the aliens. Demons are going to come forth from the abyss, manifest themselves. He's going to say, see, I'm friends with the demons. And he's going to say, the aliens are telling us to stop fighting religious wars. Let's all work together. And I'm going to help make this place a peaceful world. And the Bible actually says he succeeds for three and a half years of uniting nations, bringing them all together. And now if all you have to do to live in this utopia is just get your little identity chip it's not that big of a deal so you got to put yourself in that mindset so as we look at the antichrist let's look at what the bible says about him he will arise out of rebellion and wickedness daniel 8 23 so he will arise when everything is going crazy number two he will come from 10 kings and rule the world daniel 7 24 we talked about this probably being 10 regions of the world excuse me Number three, he will make new laws and bring peace for three and a half years, Daniel 8.24. So this is what's going to draw us to him. He's not going to come out with pitchforks and be like, I'm the devil. He's going to be like, I'm your best friend, like love me. And everybody's going to be like, yeah, we love you. Number four, he will speak many blasphemies against God, Daniel 7.25. So immediately think of this. The Bible describes Christians in this days as a small minority. The Bible talks about him hunting the Christians down. I don't see how that could happen if there's, you know, billions of us. But think about this. Those left behind, hence the name of the series, left behind, are now going to show up to church. Nobody's going to be here. They're going to read their Bible, and they're going to start calling on the name of Jesus. And the Antichrist is going to say the first thing we got to do is start killing them. And the Bible says he's going to start beheading them to keep this uh, uprising down. And that's why he's going to oppress and kill the Christians, Daniel 7.25. Number seven, he will for, force the world to take a mark, 666, which is Revelation 5.16. That says they can't buy or sell without it. And I showed you guys last week an identity chip that's here right now that could exactly do what the Bible said it would do. And then number eight, he will gather an army against Israel, Matthew 25.14. Now this is the thing that I was talking about last week with Oprah Winfrey and the Catholic Church. One of the greatest opiates of the masses that uh, Marxists and socialists believe is religion. 
And so to get people off the main subject of what's going on with the Antichrist, he's going to have to give them a bobo, something to scratch their religious itch with, to make them feel good about all the decisions they're doing. Hence the reason of the Roman Empire having emperor worship into their government. Hence the reason of the Egyptians having emperor worship. You see, when you want a world-dominating culture in a world-dominating military, you've got to convince them the one in charge is God. And I want you to think about this. The Roman Catholic Church about 10 years ago under uh, John Paul had a religious ecumenical service at the Vatican the Basilica, and had the major religions of the world pray and offer their sacrifices to God. Muslims came and prayed. Hindu priests said their chants. Buddhists and Shinto priests did their chants. And then all of these people did it. And you know what he said? We're all the same. We're all praying to the same God. And that's why I was teaching you about Oprah Winfrey. That's what she's saying. We're all praying to the same God. So now think about it. The rapture has happened. Three billion of us are missing. This man is bringing peace on the earth and who's the ones getting in the way those fundamental christians who keep talking about heaven and hell kill them let's get them out the way you know why roman people killed christians romans served all kinds of god wouldn't you just get along with that do you know why hindus kill christians hindus have over a million gods you know why because christians say our god is the only god The moment you do that in the wrong place of these empires, that's when they want to kill you. You can say he's one of many, but not the only. And that's why he'll come to power through religion and make the fundamental Christians look like they are the hate mongers, the the spreaders of violence. Let's keep going. We go on now to number eight, the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. Revelations 11 talks about this temple being there. I was given a reed like a measuring rod. This is John who's receiving this in the book of Revelation. And it said, go and measure the temple of God in the altar and count the worshipers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the city for how long? How long will they trample on the city for? 42 months. How many years is 42 months? Three and a half years. Daniel talks about that three and a half years, doesn't he? Now here's where it begins to get a little bit crazy. You see, the Antichrist has brought together the world. He has brought peace. He has brought this temple together. But now he blasphemes God in this temple, and he tries to destroy Jerusalem. When he does, God turns against him. And now for the last three and a half years, there is tribulation, the bowls of wrath upon the earth. Are you guys getting the time frame now? Rapture happens, three and a half years of building up this temple, bringing peace. And then he defiles God, the abomination which causes desolation. He'll stand in the temple, call himself God. And the Bible says now he'll trample on the city for 42 months. The biggest problem that the Jewish people have right now of rebuilding their temple in Jerusalem is what is known as the Temple Mount, where the temple has been built by Solomon and where it's supposed to be. The problem with it is that there's this place called the Dome of the Rock right next to it. And the Dome of the Rock is a religious Muslim mosque that Muslims purposely built there to oppress the Jews so the Jews couldn't build back their temple. But here is just an artist's rendering. I know it's a little pixelated, but here's an artist's rendering of how it could still be built with the Dome of the Rock. The reason is the Temple Mount is a big Temple Mount. It is not a small piece of land. Either way, we don't know how it will happen, but somehow a part of the Antichrist's great accomplishments is he will bring peace to the Middle East where there's been all of this war and fighting. He will bring peace and he'll throw a bone to the Jewish people to make them happy and say, you can build this. Let me tell you how serious Jewish people are taking this right now. There are Jewish rabbinical schools training the priests according to the Levitical order of your book of Leviticus, ready to start being the Levites in this temple right now. There are Jewish people that have already bought the items to be in there, the table of showbread, the menorah, the uh, altar of incense, the brazen laver. This has already been prepared. They are waiting for the okay to build it. It's already been funded. The priests are ready. This could happen if the rapture happens tomorrow. Are you all listening to me? Let's keep going. Now we get into the seven bowls of wrath. This is where I want to slow down, and I want you to read with me while this stays up on the screen. Will you please open your Bibles up to Revelation 16? Some of you might have got disinterested, but would you hang in with me right now? Because listen to me, my friends. If you're not right with God, you're going to see this come upon the earth. 
Jesus is not coming back as Dito Jesus in a manger, and he's not coming back singing the Barney theme song, I love you and you love me, okay? This is the Jesus of the Bible. This is a Jesus that people have rejected for 2,000 years. The gospel has been preached over the known globe, and they have refused to listen to Jesus. They have now taken the mark of the Antichrist, and you'll actually hear here, they're going to start cursing God. Remember Pharaoh? During the plagues, cursing God. Think about how sin will make a fool out of you. This God brings curses. This God sets free his people. This God separates the Red Sea. What does Pharaoh do with his army? Runs right into the Red Sea. The Bible says sin will make a fool out of you. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Come on, friends. Wake up today if you're not serving the Lord. Starting in verse 1. John, he says, I hear a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, seven angels bringing seven bowls of wrath, three and a half years of tribulation. Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Remember, I don't believe in a post-tribulation because as you hear these, you tell me if billions of us can be on this planet. Tell me if there's a way that we can avoid this. Starting with the first one, sores break out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worship the image. Some of you might say, well, if we don't have the image, we don't get the, the mark. But let's keep going. The second one, he poured out his bowl on the sea and turned it into blood. And everything died, everything in the sea. And this is talking about sea singular, so all the waters. How do we know? Keep going. Number three, the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. So that means now there's no sea or no springs of water. That means Lake Michigan is blood. That means the ocean is blood. Where water comes up from the ground is blood. No more drinking water. Everybody's affected. And look at this. Then I heard the angel in charge say, verse 5, You are just in these judgments. Why is God just in turning all the known water on our planet to blood? Because you who are and were, for they shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets. And you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Are you all tracking with me? Jesus is not playing. Jesus said, you spilt the blood of my, my people. You spilt the blood of Christians upon this planet. 100,000 now, beheading all of those then. I'm turning everything that's water here to blood. Let's keep going. Number seven. I heard the altar respond, yes, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your judgments. Number eight, the fourth angel poured out a bowl on the sun. The sun was allowed to scorch the people with fire. Is anybody hearing something about the ozone layer getting taken away and the sun coming through a scorching heat? Has anybody heard that on the news lately? Aren't environments, environmentalists talking about the melting away of our ozone layer? God says he takes it away. That's what literally is going to happen. The ozone layer that protects us from the sun is going to vanish away. They will be seared by the intense heat. But look what they'll do. They curse the name of God that had control over these plagues. But they refuse to repent and glorify him. Are you all tracking with me here? Number 10, the fifth angel poured out a bowl on the throne of the beast. The beast is the uh, Antichrist. And his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of the pains in their sores. And they refused. Somebody say they refused. Thank you to repent of what they had done. Are y'all, are y'all getting this? How many are freaked out right now? Hello? We need to get freaked out by this if you're not. The Bible says he brings sores on the people. He turns the sea into blood. He turns the springs into blood. He takes away the ozone layer. The sun scorches the people. He puts darkness on the earth. Keep going. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Why does he do that? And its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Do you know that the battle of Armageddon is the kings coming from the east to meet Jerusalem to try to destroy it? And you know what God says? Y'all can't do that because you got a river in the way. You know what? I'm going to dry up the river. Come on and bring it. That's what Jesus says. Listen to me, friends. Jesus is not a sissy. Jesus is your MMA Jesus, fellas. Listen to me. Jesus dries up a river and says, y'all want to come get it on? I'm going to clear the path. I'll meet you in Jerusalem. And the Bible says they come right to him. He dries up the river so they can come right there. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, dried its water to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now look at this, verse 13. We talked about this last week. Then I saw three impure spirits. Everybody say three impure spirits. Come on, that looked like frogs. 
You ever see these aliens? Let me tell you something. See, modern man doesn't believe in spirits of the tree and spirits of this. You know what modern man believes in? Aliens. But they are the same type of spirit. It's a demonic spirit. You listen to people that have had alien abductions sound just like demon possessions. A lot of people who have had alien encounters speak the name of Jesus. They go. Now, a lot of you think that your relatives are showing up as Aunt Mima and Cousin Bobby. Let me tell you about them, them relatives showing up. Those are demons looking like your friends and family, okay? And if you don't believe it, just call me over when they're over there talking to you about what they want you to do with the flowers and the pot. And we'll say the name Jesus, and you'll watch them go as fast as I came in the door. Are you listening? We look in the Bible, the witch of Endor. Uh, Samuel goes to, uh, Saul goes to the witch of Endor and says, I want to see the dead prophet Samuel. The witch calls him up, looks just like him, talks like him, but it was a demonic spirit. The Bible says they take on the form of people. But here in the last days, three spirits, they come, they look like frogs. I'll say they look like aliens. They're going to be green. Frogs are green. Come on, somebody. They're going to be little green men. And the Bible says they're going to come out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs. They are demonic spirits that perform signs. And they will come out to meet the kings in the whole world to gather them together for the battle of the great day of the Lord Almighty. They're going to say, come on, king of Persia. Come on, king of Iran, Ahmadinejad. Come on, let's blow some stuff up. Come on, emperor of China, let's go. These demons are going to possess these people, do signs in front of them, and draw them to the battle of Armageddon. Come on. Verse 15. Look, Jesus is talking. I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. God says, you know why I make it a mystery? You know why I'm coming like a thief? Because I want to see how you're living when I'm not around. You see, he went to the father's house for the weekend. He wants to, well, he wants to know what you're doing right now. The Bible says he's watching what we're doing. And he says he comes back when we least expect it. Verse 16. Then they are gathered together there in the place in Hebrew called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of his temple came a loud voice saying, It is done. There were flashes of lightning, rumbling, pearls of thunder, and a severe earthquake. Everybody say earthquake. Thank you. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. Verse 19, the great city split into three parts. All the nations collapsed. God remembered the great Babylon and gave her a cup filled with wrath. He said, take this. And he gives her this cup of wrath. 21, look at this. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell on the people. This speaker right here is about 75 pounds. I want you to think about a hundred pound hailstones coming from the sky. And the Bible says the plague was so terrible. The last thing is going to be an earthquake. And it says that the islands flee away and so do the mountains. Indonesia, the Philippines, Hawaii, Haiti, all going to go away, my friends. All the mountaintops are going to crumble. The Rocky Mountains, the Himalayan Mountains are going to come down. Something that I want you to think about today, friends, is where are you going to be? Are you going to be with God in the rapture that he's delivered you from this? Or are you going to watch your drinking water turn to blood? That is a question you have to ask yourself. This is your Bible. This came 2,000 years before Oprah Winfrey and all of these other people started telling you lies. If your preacher is boring you today, I'm sorry, my friends. The devil's trying to put you to sleep with a lullaby saying, It's all right. Just close your eyes. This will be over in 20 minutes. Don't pay attention to that, Pastor. Shh, hush, little baby, don't you cry. See, the devil just wants to sing you a little lullaby. He don't want you to take this serious. He wants you to think, I've just been rambling up here about whatever, you know, this is no different than anybody else talking about their kooky ideas, Nostradamus. My friends, this is Jesus. This is your Bible. And it's real, and it's going to terrify those who are upon the earth. The next thing that we see is here comes Jesus, and I want you to read it with me so you can see how serious Jesus is. It's not up here. You have to look to your Bible. Look to Isaiah 63, 1. Jesus is going to do something when he comes back. These armies are going to be gathered together against Israel. The Euphrates rivers has been dried. A billion people are going to come to destroy Israel with the Antichrist at the head. They've already had sores put on them. They've already had hailstones. They've already seen earthquakes. They've already had uh, demons come out, and nothing is stopping them. They don't care. They want to fight against God, and they're going to come to Jerusalem, and this is what he's going to do in Isaiah 
chapter 63. If you're there, can you say I'm there? Listen to what the Bible says. Matter of fact, brother, would you put this up here because I want them to see this. This will blow your mind right now that Jesus is going to do this and not only do this, but he says it. You see, some of you don't understand how serious our God is. Now, I love my father, and I think he's the best man to ever walk the face of the planet. But if I, smacked, uh, if I talk back to my mom, my dad will smack me back into next week. Are you listening to me? Are, are, are you all listening to me? See, I love the U.S. military. We have U.S. military soldiers here. I love them when they're not in uniform. We wrestle on and play. You get to Baghdad on the other side of one of their rifles, my friend. They're the most terrifying force on this planet right now. Hoorah. Come on. And I want you to understand something right here. You're looking at little Dito Jesus. You're going to come tickle him at the manger scene at the, at the hip mall or something. Let me tell you, when he comes down, he will terrify the nations. The Bible says after that great earthquake, he is coming right after that. And this is what his word is saying. Jesus is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Can you put it big for everyone to see, please? Isaiah chapter 63. Go up to verse 1. Make it a little bit bigger because I want everybody to see this. It's not pastor making this up. Thank you. Who is this coming from Edom? Edom is a part of Israel. From Bozrah with his garments stained crimson. Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? Isaiah, who saw the Lord high and lifted up, he is now saying, Who is this coming in splendor, stained in crimson? Now verse 1 and onward, he says, It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why are your garments red? Like those one treading the wine press. You've been in the wine press, you know, stepping on grapes. You got splattered here with grape juice. Anybody ever seen this done before? They, they do it in Italy, you know, they got it in California. They step on the grapes, splat, splat, makes, the, makes, makes your garment stained. He says to them, why are your garments strained, stained like you've been stopping on, at a wine press? I have trodden the wine press alone. From the nations, no one was with me. I have trampled them in my anger. I trod them down in my wrath. Their blood splattered my garments, and I stained all of my clothing. I want you guys to see what your Bible is saying right here. There will be a billion-person army coming against Israel. 300 million of them will die in a moment. The Bible goes as far to describe the blood will be as high as a horse's bridle, as high as a horse's head, for 188 miles. That is more from here to Milwaukee, my friends. Why is your garment stained, Jesus? Why does it look like you've been in a wine press, Jesus? And it's the color of crimson, dark red, because I've trodden down the enemies, no one with me. The breath, the Bible says, of him coming in the splendor of his glory. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redemption has come. I want you to understand something, my friends. You see, atheists say, where's your God? Where's your God? All of this bad happens in the world. Let me tell you something. Both Christians and atheists agree on one thing. We hate evil in the world. We hate child molesters in the world. We hate the evil that Hitler did and all of these people. But there's one difference. When atheists die, nothing happens. Christians, we believe Jesus is coming back. And Jesus said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. No one gets away with it, my friends. No one. Even when Hitler took his own life, he stood before God's judgment and will be punished for eternity. All of these nations against God, over a billion of them, none of them get away with it, friends. God says, I take vengeance. That's why he said, turn the other cheek, because he said, vengeance is mine. He said, vengeance is mine. He said, I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm worked salvation for me, and my own wrath sustained me. His wrath will give him the energy to keep trotting down the enemies of God. That literally will be his motivation, will come from his wrath. I trampled the nations in my anger. You aren't even ready for this. In my wrath, I made them drunk and poured their blood on the ground. You ever watch 300 where somebody gets sliced and blood gurgles up into their throat? You ever seen a movie where they show when a sword cuts a man by the throat and he gurgles on his own blood? The Bible says. Now some of you might be turned off by this. Let me just help you understand the justice of this. You see, murder for us to do this is wickedness and evil because we didn't create this world. Some people say, I don't like the rules of this universe. Well, okay, then create your own and make your own rules. We already got a creator of this universe. Amen? And this is what he said. He said, I'm in charge. 
And he said, confess with your mouth your sins and you will be forgiven. He said, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. He told us all of these messages. You know it. All the presidents of our nation know it. Most of the world is hearing it right now. Missionaries are spreading forth more like ever before. They're teaching the word of God. The gospel is growing and people are hearing it. But those who reject it, the Bible says in Hebrews 10.26, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That is the God that we serve. The Bible talks about a day of judgment. But my friend, today there is a day of salvation. Before he comes down as a king, he is coming to meet you here as your Savior. So what is he going to do? He's going to rescue Israel. And then he's going to throw the Antichrist into the lake of fire. And I don't have time to get into all of these scriptures about the millennial reign. But what he will do is he will set up a kingdom on this earth. Not all of humans and mankind will have been destroyed in that last battle. There will be people left. Those of us who had went in the rapture will come down to the earth with those who have been martyred and we will rule with Christ a thousand years. They who had came to life reigned with Christ a thousand years. They were priests of God, of Christ, and will reign with Him a thousand years. We will be in this new kingdom. Why? Because the devil doesn't get the last laugh here. You see, if God destroys it and blows it all up, it's like, you know what? The devil ruined God's playground for mankind, so now he's got to do something else. No, God comes back and says, I'm going to make it just the way I wanted it. And so for a thousand years, we live on the same earth. We live here in the same environment, but our God is with us. And the Bible says the lion will lay with the lamb. It will be the greatest time of peace. The Antichrist and all these others will be in hell. The devil, the dragon will be bound up for these thousand years. And people will live and die. And a baby will live, the Bible says, to a hundred years. The youngest will live to a hundred. Some will even live the whole time. You go back in the Bible days, they live six, seven, nine hundred years. Matter of fact, when people study anthropology, how modern man ages, there's really no reason why we have to age. But there's something that continually brings our body to decline. So God will take out those genes that he had cursed us with at the time of Noah and only allowed us to live 70, 80 years and he will allow mankind to live on and then at the end of that thousand year reign he will then bring up everybody from the dead and he will then begin to judge us. The great white throne judgment will bring all of our lives into perspective. After that thousand years, those who have been in hell this whole time as the county jail will be brought forth. And the Bible talks about there being books. And it says here, I saw a great right throne. He who was sat on it, the earth and sky fled. Revelation 20:11. And there was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened and another book was opened, the book of life. Can you say the book of life? Thank you. The, the dead were judged according to what they had done in those books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. So where does death and hell go? To the lake of fire. Thank you. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. How does it look at the end? All those in hell now will come before God. And there will be books, plural, on one side and one book on the other side. The books, plural, are going to name all the works of men, all the evil they've done, every secret thought you've had against your neighbor, every perverted thought you've had towards the the opposite sex, same sex, towards animals. It don't matter. It's all going to be in this book right here. All the anger, all the cursing, every thought, action, and deed, bam. And then there's going to be another book that says forgiven, bought by the blood of the Lamb. Your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life forgiven time will be no more we will be there for what will seem like an infinite amount of time everybody's life moment to moment you will see everybody's life laid out before them clearly and the bible says that day will be a great day of terror people will be weeping you'll be seeing your lost family members be sentenced to hell forever then the bible says he's going to wipe away every tear and then he will raise from all remembrance their name anything they've done how could heaven be how could the new earth be enjoyable for you if you're remembering your sister your daughter your child is not there with you the bible says they will be remembered no more the mother will forget her womb if you don't if your daughter doesn't know Jesus mother you're not going to know him on the new earth he will take away the remembrance we're not going to be on the new earth talking about what Hitler did he will be erased from our memories that's what the bible says every tear will be wiped away are you all listening to me the bible says they will be forgotten there is a judgment day coming heaven and hell is at stake for you right now 
You see, right now we're in the time of God's mercy. The rapture has not happened. The Antichrist is not here. You are in a time of great mercy and compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. You live in a free nation where you can confess Him freely. And so there's nothing that should hold you back today than for living for Jesus. You also have the time to join with the great church, the Ark of God. This is the place of salvation. We can invite as many on here, two by two, to come. You can go out and be great preachers for the Lord Jesus Christ. The Greek word and and, an Aramaic word is Maranatha, even so, Lord, come. We should be telling the whole world, Jesus is coming, and come quickly, Lord. The Bible says that after that time of judgment, our final place will be a new heaven and a new earth. The holy city, New Jerusalem, will come from heaven and set itself upon this earth, and we will forever be with the Lord, Revelation 21, 6 and onward. And what they give the dimensions of New Jerusalem is 1,400 miles wide and it's as high as it is wide and it's the shape of a box. Get an idea of what New Jerusalem is going to look like. 1,400 feet up in the air. 1,400, excuse me, miles. 1,400 miles up in the air. 1,400 miles wide and it's shaped as a box. It's going to be larger than the continent of Africa and India. This is the New Jerusalem. The Bible says on this day that there will be no more darkness, so this isn't exactly a great picture, and there will be no more need of atmosphere. We're in spiritual bodies. So imagine coming to New Jerusalem. The Bible says out of New Jerusalem, the sun will sit upon his throne, and from his throne will flow the rivers of God, which is the Holy Spirit, crystal clear river. And on the side of this river will be trees bringing healing to the nations. And the Bible says he will be for the Father from his heavenly place. The Father will remain in unapproachable life. But we will see the Father through him, and we will forever be with the Lord. Can you stand up and give Jesus Christ a hand clap of praise? Come on, if you believe he's coming, man, would you come as well? Thank you, Jesus. I tried to go through this as quickly as I can. This is the timeline of what the Bible gives us. You might say, Pastor, well, you might be off on a couple stuff. Okay. I might be off on about five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let me tell you what I'm not off on. I'm not off on Jesus coming back number 10. Okay? And all those other things, they may be rearranged a little differently, but it's all going to happen, my friends. I know when we hear in time sermons, sometimes we can be just so enthralled with the knowledge, it doesn't become application. I pray that doesn't happen today. This wasn't meant to impress you in some study that I did. It was meant to show you, my friends, Jesus is coming back. This whole series, I have taken great pains. I usually study four or five hours for a sermon, and then I have to make it. Excuse me. We're talking triple days I've been studying to be able to simplify this for you to see. Why? Because you're going to face Jesus, as surely as he came the first time, he's coming again, my friends, the second time. And the world is telling you right now, where is his coming? The mockers are are mocking you going, it's always been the same. This is not true. And the Bible warned us that these times would come. And Jesus himself said, let not your heart grow cold. In these last days, there are so many Christians getting cold hearts, turning their back on Jesus. I shared this message out of love for you. The book of Revelation isn't there just to scare the hell out of us and become some type of horror show. It's there to tell us, You don't want to be there. That's how bad. Do you know Jesus talked two times more about hell in the New Testament than he ever did about heaven? How much would you tell your daughter about, you know, going and getting ice cream compared to being careful about crossing the street? You'll tell her maybe once or twice, we're going to go get ice cream today. But you'll tell them continually throughout their lifetime, You better be careful. Make sure you check, you know, when you cross the street because you know what will happen if they don't. That's what Jesus is doing. He's telling us over and over and over again from Daniel to Zechariah to the book of Joel to Malachi to Revelation to the Gospels to to the epistles. He's saying, I'm coming back. I've just gone away for a few days. Will you be ready when I come? 
He says, I'm coming like a thief in the night when you don't expect it. Anybody here is a manager? You don't come show up and check on your employees at, you know, the most opportune time. You want to go check on them the time they expect you to leave. He gave a parable saying that exact thing. He says he will come like a manager when the workers expect him the least. When they should be just mopping the floor at the end of the night, he wants to go check on you. Are you doing what I asked you to do? He wants to check on you, friends. I'm going to ask my altar workers to come. We're just going to tell Jesus we love them before we pray. If you love them, would you raise your hand because he loves you. Altar workers, would you come? We're going to close out in just a few moments. Would you give God just a few more moments today, friends? Don't leave yet. Jesus, we love you. I know those of us who already are saved, God, we can't hear a message like this without taking a few moments to say we love you. Oh, God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. If you ever doubt how much God wants to spare you from this day, then think of the cross. The cross says, I don't want you punished. The cross says, I'll lay down my life so you don't suffer. Come on, somebody thank Him for the cross today. For forgiveness. None of us deserve the heaven and the new earth, but He gives it to us out of grace. The Bible says we all deserve His wrath. We've all sinned. We deserve punishment. But He's been kind to us. His loving kindness never ends for us. Oh, He forgives our sin and forgets our sin as far as the east is from the west. He says whoever's in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Old has gone. All things become new. Jesus, thank you. Jesus. We're going to close out in prayer. When I pray, you you will be dismissed because I know I went long today. So after we pray, you will be dismissed. But I just ask you today to consider your eternal soul. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Whether it's His rapture or His great white throne judgment, are you ready to meet the Lord? The Bible also says in the book of Revelation, Ben, would you just kick it down just a little bit, please? With every head bowed and eyes closed, the Bible says, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. Will you let him in today? The Bible says that, think about this king who is stained in blood, like he's been trotting on a wine press. The Bible says in that same book, like a gentleman, He knocks at your door. And he says, will you let me in? He says, if you let me in, I will eat with you and you will eat with me. Representing being at his throne, uh, in his kingdom. Psalms 23, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He stands at the door and knocks. I'm going to ask you to search your heart. We're going to pray. And if you need Jesus, don't leave out of here without us praying with you to accept him, without us showing you how to receive forgiveness.